To get to the truth of the matter about Gen Z and millennial voting patterns, we have with us Victor Shi, who is the strategy director at Voters of Tomorrow. He's also the co-founder and co-host of a really terrific podcast called the iGen Politics Podcast with Jill Weinbanks. Victor, it is so good to have you here. You know, we've all seen your analysis on TV about this election, but I really wanted to dive in and ask you, you know, about this subject and try to understand better how Gen Z and the millennial generation showed up to vote and arguably prevented the red wave that Republicans and many in the media expected. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. So what did happen in this election with regard to young voters? Yeah. So basically, the bottom line for the election that we saw a couple of weeks ago was that young voters turned out in overwhelming numbers to vote for Democrats in this cycle. And you kind of can see that in basically a few battleground states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Arizona, and even a place like Georgia. So basically, what you saw was young voters overwhelmingly broke 2018 turnout records. And in those states, the majority of young voters cast their ballots for Democrats. So people like John Fetterman, people like Raphael Warnock. And that was a trend that I think a lot of Republicans and pollsters really didn't kind of, I guess, see before the election because one of the things I think you you saw before the election was a lot of polling and young people really just don't pick up the phone. We don't really respond to polling in the conventional way. And so I think that's where you saw a lot of that discrepancy. And the other, I think, fascinating thing about this election was that young Republicans stayed home or either either barely increased or didn't even turn out as high numbers uh, compared to 2018. And so I think you saw this kind of confluence of factors contribute to this uh, kind of lack of red wave and this overwhelming kind of vote for Democrats in a year where Democrats really shouldn't have gotten as many votes as they they did this time around. So why do you think young voters who are Democrats came out, and this was the second highest turnout of young voters in the last 30 years, the first being the 2018 election, midterm election. So why do you think young Democratic voters came out, but young Republicans, as you just said, stayed home? So I think there are two factors for why Democrats turned out to vote overwhelmingly. And I think first is kind of the fall of abortion. And that was uh, back in June. And really since then, it was this really kind of sustained momentum going into the uh, 2022 election. You saw Kansas kind of being the first indication that what pollsters and pundits were saying were just kind of really off. Young people registered to vote, women in Kansas registered to vote. And that election, you saw record turnout. And a lot of that was driven because of this kind of sense from young people that a right that we kind of grew up with was overturned by the Supreme Court. So you kind of have that factor. And then in addition to that, this Republican Party doing a lot to really kind of attack our lives. So starting, you know, earlier this spring, there were all of these kind of don't say gay bills starting in Florida and across state legislatures that are controlled by Republicans. You saw a lot of kind of banning critical race theory conversations, which is already kind of that's another topic, but that's only taught in law schools. But Republicans made it a sticking point for campaigns going into the 2022 election. So that's kind of on one front, what Republicans were doing with uh, young lives. And then I think on the other front, just kind of Democrats and President Biden delivering on a lot of their promises made on the campaign trail. You know, I remember running to become a delegate back in uh, 2020. And one of the things I thought was fascinating was young people really weren't that enthusiastic about Joe Biden because they thought he wasn't as progressive enough as someone like Bernie Sanders. But I think what you have been seeing with this administration is just time and time again, the Biden administration, Democrats have been delivering on a lot of the core issues that young people care about, like climate change, like student loan forgiveness. And so I think it's just kind of this clear contrast between two parties that young people really understood. And that's why you saw a lot of young people cast their votes for Democrats. And then a lot of those young Republicans, I think it has to go to what Mitch McConnell said uh, a couple months ago, which is just candidate quality. A lot of the candidates that Republicans put forth were just really insane and election deniers, extremist Republicans, people like Kerry Lake and people like, I don't know, J.D. Vance, even though he won. But a lot of these Republicans were just so antithetical to uh, the values that young people believe in. So you're saying across the board, young people really rejected election denialism and they're really much more interested in the issues. Absolutely. So before the election, uh, the group that I'm with, Voters of Tomorrow, we uh, conducted a poll and our poll was slightly different from most polls in the sense that we really kind of harness social media and texting and kind of having those conversations where young people are. And one of the things that we asked young people is, what are you most concerned about? And more than 70 percent of young people that we asked were concerned about just the extremism that's going on with the Republican Party. And you saw that in states like Arizona, where Carrie Lake 
as well as, you know, Mark Kelly, you know, though that election was definitely very contested and, you know, young people turn out to vote overwhelmingly for the Democratic candidate. And those were that was an election where you saw kind of Republicans kind of using Arizona as ground zero for a lot of election denialism. And then also someone like, you know, Dr. Oz or someone like Herschel Walker. So I think a lot of these states, are, you saw young people just go out to the ballot box and just say, you know, we are going to vote for the party that cares about us. And we're fed up with this kind of extreme lying that's going on with the Republican party. So one of the stats that really is striking to me, Victor, is that you look at the turnout in this last midterm election, and it was among 18 to 29 year olds, it was about 27%. So that's still pretty low. And in 2018, it was 31%. Pretty low. What needs to happen to raise those numbers where both young Republicans and young Democrats turn out to vote more? Because I I know that part of what you're doing is just trying to get people who are young, Gen Z, millennial, just to come out and vote no matter what their party is. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's one of the goals of Voters of Tomorrow. That's one of the goals that I've been pushing for since I got involved in politics is just getting young people civically empowered and out there voting. And I think, you know, going back to what you were saying about the 27 percent number, I wish that number were higher. But a lot of that reason is because, like we were saying earlier, young Republicans just stayed home where they didn't turn out as high as rates, you know, as compared to 2018. And so that's, I think, why you're, you're seeing the overall turnout drag a little bit down compared to 2018. But I think just going forward, one of the most important things is just an investment from uh, the political parties into where young voters are. So that means starting when they're young. So basically getting them registered to vote in high school. A lot of us are living in states where once you turn 18, you're automatically registered to vote. Or when you turn 17, you're automatically registered to vote. So finding those kind of ways to get young people registered to vote and kind of aware about the civics process, but also just providing as many resources as possible. You're seeing across the country, one of the unique things about America is that there's this kind of patchwork of election rules. And so while I live in Illinois, someone in Georgia might have a different set of election rules that might you know, make it harder to vote. So kind of meeting young people on the ground and letting them know what are the resources, what are the kind of tools that they need to go out there and cast their ballot, because every, everywhere is different. And so I think just getting young people aware of the, kind of the civics process earlier on is really important. And I think just kind of in terms of framing kind of how to get involved in politics for young voters uh, should definitely improve. So a lot of the times, I think there's a lot of emphasis placed on the national conversation and what can happen federally. But Politics is all local. And so if you can get young people to think about, you know, what's happening in their school district or what's happening in their county, it's much easier to kind of see and kind of vision change that way. And so I think part of it's just really investing in young people where they are, but also making sure that we talk to young voters and empowering them in our our conversations. Another statistic that I've seen that is really pretty interesting is that in the next election in 2024, presidential election coming up, Gen Z and millennial voters will account for almost 40 percent of voters. It's never been higher than that, right? So basically what we've seen starting in 2018 is just the Gen Z and millennial vote combined is only growing in political power. And for the first time ever in 2024, that's going to outnumber any generation older than us. So when we talk about, you know, what Gen Zers want and what we, I think, kind of deserve is we should just deserve more kind of representation. And we saw in 2018 and 2020, one of the things that we did is we helped elect Democrats and we helped prevent Republicans from gaining control. And we did the same thing in 2022. And so we're only growing in political power, which means that our vote is going to matter even more than it once did a couple of weeks ago or a couple of years ago. And so a lot of that means for Gen Zers and uh, millennials, you know, we showed up at the ballot box. Now it's up to Democrats to really meet us where we are and, and the political parties to meet us where we are and really acknowledge that they're going to listen to us and kind of address our concerns. And that's, I think, how you're going to kind of sustain this momentum from Gen Zers and millennials. So if you're a candidate in 2024, whether you're Joe Biden or another Democrat, whether you're Donald Trump or another Republican like DeSantis, for instance, who seems to be one of the front runners as well as Donald Trump for the Republican nomination, you sure better think about your voting strategy towards young people, right? Definitely. And when you talk about outreach with young people, I think a lot of people tend to you know, overcomplicate it. The most important thing is meeting young people where they are, which is different from how you meet maybe older generations in the sense that we just aren't really in physical in-person spaces. We're more digitally connected than any generation in America. More than 95% of us have at least one social media platform. And so when you talk about having those conversations with young voters, the digital space is going to be critical. But other than that, it's just listening to young voters and really understanding our concerns. I think that's what 
Democrats and President Biden has learned just really well is being able to listen to our concerns and then acting on our concerns. And that's, I think, why a lot of young people turn out to vote for Democrats this election cycle. And I think if I, you know, if any Republicans are out there running for office or just kind of want to reach young voters, it's all about listening and understanding our concerns and then meeting us where we are. So let's talk about those electronic spaces that young voters are, are in. So Gen Z and millennials, both, you know, digital natives were born into being, you know, on the web. You also said that, you know, the polls don't really reflect that population because people who are your age, people who are 18 to 29 year olds, they, they typically don't answer the telephone, but they'll answer a text. So how does polling need to change to really account for them? There's one question. And the second question is, what do candidates need to do to reach young people if they are on social media and in digital spaces? So I'll address the first question. And I think when we talk about polling, I, I hope after this election, one of the biggest lessons that we can all learn is just not to trust polling as much as we did back in, you know, maybe 2016, 2018, because time and time again, it wasn't so much the numbers that they got wrong, but more of the analysis. And I think that's where you saw a lot of that, you know, just disconnect between what happened on election day and before an election day. So I hope going forward, we, we don't pay as much attention to polls as we once did. But just I think in terms of how you kind of get a sense of where young voters are, I think a lot of it just has to do with just digital spaces, having those conversations individually with young voters. I think it's just really hard to reach young voters if you do it through the phone or or just kind of do it in the conventional way. And one of my friends I talk to quite frequently, John Della Volpe, does this massive um, Harvard Youth Poll every year. And one of the ways that he does it is when he talks to young voters, he makes sure to really address the values and really understand what their values are. And that kind of helps build a conversation. So a lot of talking to young voters shouldn't just be, you know, whether or not you support abortion or you don't support abortion, but really, you know, what are the values that you believe most in? And then kind of go from there. I think polling is definitely going to change and maybe it'll be more texting. Maybe it'll be less phone calls. We'll, we'll see about that. But in terms of, I think, how candidates can really kind of harness the digital space, I think this generation is really unique because our attention spans are also really short. And so part of the challenge for a lot of candidates and campaigns is being able to create these kind of short but entertaining, digestible kind of bits of information that'll speak to young voters. So, you know, one campaign I'm thinking, for instance, of that did this just phenomenally is the John Fetterman campaign. He really capitalized on his brand as this kind of authentic guy. And he created, you know, some Fetter memes, which is just kind of totally uh, something that young people would resonate with. And so I think they did it really well. The John Ossoff and Reverend uh, Raphael Warnock campaign back in 2020 harnessed TikTok and other streaming platforms like Twitch because they knew that that's where young voters were at. And so they would create these really entertaining uh, TikTok videos and go on Twitch and kind of, you know, be in the same space as a lot of the uh, streamers and gamers. And so I think it's just at the end of the day, you know, wh whether or not you're using TikTok or Instagram or other streaming platforms to be authentic and then just try to you know, be as entertaining to people while also giving people the information that they need uh, to understand the stakes of the election. So candidates aren't really going to be able to reach young voters on Twitter and Facebook anymore. They really need to go to TikTok and Twitch is what I'm hearing. Yeah. So a lot of the, you know, the conventional way to reach voters like Twitter and Facebook, the audience for those platforms are just skewed way older. And so a lot of the younger people are, are definitely concentrated on platforms like Twitch, Snapchat, um, Instagram, and TikTok for sure. And so, you know, a lot of people in my generation, for instance, and I'm Gen X, think of TikTok, you know, or at least initially thought of TikTok as something for music and dance videos. But it's really transformed into a, an information flow source, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. One of the, I mean, you know, there's a lot of criticism for TikTok and just really any social media platform in the sense that misinformation can definitely run rampant. There can be a lot of just lies that pervade, especially if you don't have those kind of tools to know how to spot misinformation. And that's hopefully another conversation that maybe we can have later, just to kind of news literacy. But in terms of, you know, what TikTok has become, it's really become a just a great source for news. You have a lot of people trying to, one, debunk misinformation and, and kind of the lies out there. But it's also just a lot of journalists are out there just kind of reporting and, and giving people a good sense of what's going on. So I'm thinking, for instance, of Someone like, for example, the Supreme Court, SCOTUS Blogs has this great account that has more than, I think, 200,000 followers, and they get great pickup over just kind of reporting on the Supreme Court and what cases they're covering. And that's a way that you can reach young voters. They're usually about 60 second videos, very easy to kind of listen to or watch when you're, you know, on the move. And so 
I think TikTok has definitely become a place where young voters can go for information and resources and where, and where kind of political activism can uh, really shine through. And you can do the same thing on Instagram, can't you, with reels and things like that. It's basically a very similar thing. And that is also a place where young people really live. You know, going back to you just mentioned John Della Volpe at Harvard. One of the things that he has said in his research is that a couple of the key issues that came from this last election, this last midterm election, was that young people were concerned that rights were being taken away from them and that democracy was flailing. Do you see that as a huge issue going forward? Definitely. So I, I think one of the things that young people are especially are going to be paying attention to, especially with Republicans taking control of the House, is how much these attacks are sustained on our lives. One of the things that poll after poll captured uh, leading up to election, definitely the Harvard Youth Poll, was that young people just felt tired of kind of their lives being attacked and kind of just going back to it started with abortion, then with, you know, don't say gay bills. You know, all of these things were kind of really kind of surgically targeted to kind of make young voters in our lives kind of harder. And you saw a lot of that, especially with voter ID laws being put into place in college campuses. And so I think going forward, Gen Zers and millennials are really going to be paying attention to what Republicans do once they ha have control of Congress. Will they be a party that, you know, continues to make it harder for us to vote, continues to make it harder for, you know, our rights? Or will it be a party that tries to listen to us and, and enact things that will improve our lives? And so that's going to, be, I think, be key for young voters. And I think just the, the second point that you were mentioning in terms of, you know, John's, John's poll and, and I think just a lot of Democrats is I think you're going to be seeing a lot of young people still kind of put pressure on the Biden administration and Democrats and how they kind of bring young voters into the fold. And uh, I think there's a big push from a lot of young activists across the country to form some sort of youth advisory council, which would basically set up a panel or basically kind of be an executive branch in the presidency and kind of be that voice for young people to gather and then kind of give the president recommendation policies. And so I think that's going to be the two fronts where young voters can pay most, most attention to. And would, would that be a bipartisan commission or is that something that Democrats are trying to organize? Yeah, so that would be a bipartisan commission. And so it would have to pass Congress, but basically funding would come from Congress and then President Biden and, and his White House would have the ability to basically form a young advisory coalition of just young voters, how they choose could be Republicans, could be Democrats, could be both, and, and kind of bring them to the table to listen to us and then to include us uh, at the table for um, whatever policies that the administration is thinking of passing. Well, and it's interesting because one of the things that I'm hearing you say is that young voters, whether they are Republican leaning or Democrat leaning or, you know, registered, they both sound like they want very similar things. Absolutely. So I think just the, at the end of the day, it's just our lives improving. I think a lot of young people have similar experiences, no matter where you come from, things like climate change, that affects all of us. You know, shooter drills, you know, I, it's unfortunate that we have to be at this time where it seems like every single day there are multiple mass shootings, over, you know, 600 mass shootings since uh, the beginning of this year. And it seems like it's not stopping at all. But for young people, that's a reality that we all have to live in. No matter which school you go to, there is basically a mass shooter drill. And so that's something that young people really understand. Things like student loan debt. A lot of young people go to college. We understand how expensive college tuition is. And so I think on the values, a lot of young people agree with kind of what needs to be done to improve our lives. And maybe it's the process that we disagree on. But at the end of the day, we want to see the outcome the same. It's just what both parties offer that might be different. So one of the things that you mentioned a few minutes ago was news literacy, and that's something that we study pretty closely as it relates to misinformation and disinformation and in, in terms of political polarization. What relationship do you think news literacy has with political polarization in this country? I think it has a pretty strong correlation because I think one of the things that happens when you become aware of how to spot misinformation and disinformation is you become much more equipped to kind of go through the noise and really kind of make your voice heard in this election cycle. One of the things that I have kind of, it's really stuck with me is I read this book by Hannah Arden, who's this just really phenomenal philosopher. And she wrote this book during World War II about totalitarianism and how the goal of so much information being thrown at you isn't to make you believe that, for example, vaccines are bad or that democracy is collapsing. It's to really get you to shut down as a unit. And once you shut down as a unit, you become very susceptible to polarization and the attempts to basically kind of create this division and fear among just your base. And so I think news literacy is super important for young people, especially this kind of upcoming generation that's really digitally connected. And so I think it starts in the classroom. I think 
teachers. And I'm proud that my home state, Illinois, is one of the few states that actually has now news literacy starting in middle school and going through high school. And I think it really starts in the classroom to get young people prepared about how to spot lies and how to kind of, you know, spot misleading headlines. Um, one of the things that I know my co-host, Joe Wine Banks, really kind of stresses is, you know, when you read an article, there are always hyperlinks. So you click on those hyperlinks to get to the original source. And that's a skill that I think everyone should cultivate. But at the end of the day, you know, it's it's kind of being equipped as people who are just living in this democracy. It's a scary world out there. And I think as long as we have the knowledge and the information to know how to kind of go through that process, we become much more empowered and we can kind of dismiss the attempts to kind of create that division and exhaustion. That's really interesting that Illinois is taking the lead on this. You know, something that, that I've been talking about forever is that how news literacy needs to start even younger than middle school. And you can make it age appropriate as you get down even into elementary school. Do you think that's something that's going to the rest of the country is going to follow? I hope other states follow suit. And hopefully, you know, I, I don't know what this co- news Congress is going to look like, but this seems to me a, like a pretty bipartisan issue. A lot of Republicans in Illinois voted for that bill. And I think, you know, there are other states, I'm not quite sure which ones off the top of my mind, that are kind of pursuing new, more news literacy. Because at the end of the day, we're all in this space. We all should have the kind of ability to know what misinformation is, what disinformation looks like. And that should cut across any party line, in my opinion. So I hope more states will follow suit uh, and kind of impose news literacy earlier on, like you said. So, Victor, in your mind, besides you know, addressing news literacy as a tool, what can young voters do to deal with polarization in the current political landscape? I think just kind of double checking everything that we post. I think there's this kind of natural tendency among a lot of people, especially young people, you know, we kind of fall into clickbait headlines. We we kind of see something that's too good to be true. Usually when it's too good to be true, think twice, don't post. Make sure that you kind of check the source, check who's reporting it. And I think as long as we do that, then it becomes much easier to kind of spread the good news and the the positive news and, and accurate information. And so I think that's part of it. And then the other part of it is just trying to be aware of what's happening around us. You know, subscribe to information that you trust. Subscribe to things like, you know, for me personally, it's Axios and the New York Times and the Washington Post that I kind of trust those sources but always double check and and just try not to kind of be the purveyor of misinformation, I guess. Well, Victor, this has been extremely insightful. Thank you very much for helping us understand all this. Thanks so much for having me.